Welcome to the Anchor Course. You know, in Matthew 16, you'll find one of the most important questions in all the Bible. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Now this question wasn't asked in ignorance because he knew the hearts of his men and neither was it asked in insecurity. I mean, sometimes we feel we need to ask our marriage partners, do you still love me? Or uh, if we're a leader, sometimes we're tempted to ask, what are people saying about me? But Jesus had none of this insecurity. He asked them that question because the answer to that question makes all the difference in the world. And it was Simon Peter who spoke up for the group and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, who do you say that Jesus is? I suppose there are a lot of complicated ways to explain what Christians believe about Jesus, but I want to use a simple image. Jesus was the ultimate free diver. A free diver's only equipment is a mask and maybe a wetsuit. She draws in one breath of air and then sees how far down that one breath will take her. The world record in free diving is held by Tanya Streeter. On August 17, 2002, she held her breath, plunged 525 feet deep, and rose to the surface again. Sports Illustrated named her the world's most perfect athlete in that year. Born in the Cayman Islands, uh, Tanya Streeter now lives in Austin. Now today, free diving is an extreme sport designed to test the limits, but it came from more practical uses. For thousands of years, pearl divers would draw in one breath of air and plunge to the seabed. In Tahiti, they were known to dive as deep as 100 to 130 feet. And from there, they would bring back treasures to the surface. Jesus is the ultimate free diver. He plunged down from heaven to the human experience, even down to the depths of death itself, and then he rose up, bringing what he treasures with him. I want you to notice how the Apostles' Creed puts it. We begin in the heights. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And then comes the descent to the depths of human experience. Down and further down, the words take us. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried. And then comes the ascent back to the courts of heaven again. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now, these phrases speak of the divinity of Jesus and the virgin birth of Jesus and the conscience existence of Jesus and death and the resurrection of Jesus, the living presence of Jesus in heaven. I mean, these concepts can cause our head to spin. But remember, what we want to do is simply see the movement of the free diver. Jesus left the heights of heaven. He plunged down into the experience of humanity, even into human death. And then he rose back up to the heights of heaven, this time carrying treasure in his hand. Treasure, namely you and me. Now imagine Jesus standing here asking you what he asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? How would you answer? First, Jesus is everything it means to be God. Imagine one of those pearl divers at the surface preparing for a deep plunge. Her experience is very different on the surface than the experience she's about to have down below. Above, she breathes air, she feels the wind, she hears the words of encouragement from her friends, she squints to the bright sunlight in a blue sky. All of that's gonna be left behind when she descends for her prize below. Now that's the image I get when I read about the heights from which Jesus came to live our kind of life on this earth. We confess that Jesus is Christ. He is God's only son. He is our Lord. All those phrases speak of the unique nature of Jesus. He was and he is much more than another prophet or simply a great moral teacher. He is everything it means to be God. Here's what we read in John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word. That's a reference to Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. But now let's ask a practical question. I mean, why should that matter? Is the divinity of Jesus nothing more than a dry theological fact? Oh, it's so much more than that. I want you to write down two reasons why it matters. First, because every, uh, Jesus is everything it means to be God, Jesus is the best qualified to teach us about God. Here's how your Bible puts it in Hebrews chapter one. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. In John chapter 14, verse nine, Jesus himself said, anyone 
who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus wasn't simply a man who was filled with the presence of God. Jesus was the presence of God. And so if you want to know what makes God smile, look at what made Jesus smile. If you want to know what captures the attention of God, see what captured the attention of Jesus. If you want to know what enrages God, look at what made Jesus angry. Now, it wasn't that the prophets before Jesus were inaccurate. What they had to say was completely true. It's just that what they had to say wasn't truly complete. Jesus came to complete the picture. So the prophets gave us principles about God, but Jesus gave us the person of God. And so any claim about who God is or what God likes has got to be measured by the words and life of that man who was God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Second, because Jesus is everything it means uh, to be God, the sacrifice of Jesus was God paying our penalty himself. From cover to cover, the Bible shows us that in order to be saved, our sins have to be paid for. But the wonderful truth of the gospel is that God came to do that job himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. You see, the, uh, the astonishing claim of the gospel is that the man hanging upon the cross was the creator himself giving himself up to save his prized creation. So if Jesus was here to ask you, who do you say that I am? After looking at all these Bible passages, you should be able to say, Jesus, you're everything it means to be God. Here's the second truth about Jesus. Jesus is everything it means to be human. Imagine again one of those pearl divers. On the surface, she breathes air, she feels the wind, she hears the words of encouragement, she squints at the bright sunlight in a blue sky, but then suddenly she plunges below the surface into a very different world. Deeper and deeper she goes until colors fade and then light fades. Warmer surface water gives way to the black and cold and further down she goes until she's at the oyster bed, digging her hands into the muck and the ooze to pull out the gnarled shells of oysters. Well, that's the image I get when I read about what we call the incarnation, the act of God becoming man. Jesus is everything it means to be human. Look at the first chapter of John again. Now, not only does verse 1 say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but verse 14 goes on to say, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the Apostles' Creed uh, that we read a moment ago, it says that Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our Lord, was conceived, born, suffered, and died. In other words, our Creator visited His creation in person. He experienced everything it means to be human. Now, His conception was remarkable, of course, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin, but His birth involved all the blood and pain and exhaustion of any other birth, and he grew up facing all the experiences of any other man. As a carpenter, when he hit his thumb, it would throb and a black bruise would rise. And when he walked, his feet got blistered. He sneezed at pollen, his stomach grumbled at dinner time. He laughed at a good joke. He enjoyed parties, he cried at funerals. And he suffered and died like any other human would under the same circumstances. You know, the interesting thing about the Apostles' Creed is that though it's supposed to be a short summary of, of Christian belief, the Creed spends a lot of time belaboring the point that Jesus experienced everything it means to be human. We say he suffered, and specifically he suffered under a named man, Pontius Pilate. In other words, the story of Jesus isn't one of those stories that begins long, long ago in a land far, far away. Instead, the God of the universe suffered injustice and torture in a specific place in a specific time. When we recite the part of the Apostles' Creed, we say rhythmically, crucified, dead, buried. Uh, Jesus experienced everything it means to be human, not only up to the point of death, but into the experience of death itself. Now, Christians believe that Jesus is everything it means to be human, but again, why should that matter? Well, let's write two reasons down why it matters. First, because Jesus is everything it means to be human, he is our example. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, several times in the New Testament, we're told that Christ's suffering is a standard. It's a benchmark 
that we hold up against our own faithfulness through suffering. In other words, the way Jesus handled mistreatment is the way we ought to act when we're mistreated. The patience, the refusal to retaliate, the willingness to forgive, the undying trust in Father God, all that Jesus did when he suffered is the way we ought to act when we suffer. And that principle extends throughout all of life. Second, I want you to write this one down. Because Jesus is everything it means to be human, he is our encourager, not just our example, but our encourager. Aren't you glad that Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 is in the Bible? It's one of my favorite passages, and I've included it on your outline. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, sometimes we want to pray, Lord, I'm tempted down here. Or, Jesus, I'm struggling down here. Or, Lord, life just hasn't been fair to me recently. It's good to know that we can bring those things to a Lord who can say, I know what you mean, but hang in there. So who is Jesus? He's everything it means to be God and at the same time, everything it means to be human. Here's a third truth about Jesus. Jesus lives to bring our needs to the Father's attention. Now imagine that pearl diver again. At the surface, she breathed fresh air. She felt the wind on her face. She heard the words of encouragement from her friends. She squinted at the bright sunlight and a blue sky. But then she plunged below the surface and deeper and deeper she went until colors faded and light faded and warmer surface water gave way to black and cold water. And Yes, she continued until she was able to dig her hands into the muck and ooze and pull out the gnarled shells of oysters. But then comes the ascent, and with her treasures in hand, she begins to rise, eyes to the surface, lungs bursting, finally breaking the surface, and with a smile of triumph to those in the boat, she holds up her prizes, oysters filled with pearls. Well, that's what Jesus did for us. He descended to our depths so that he might bring us up to his heights. We are the treasures he descended to get. We are the reason he made the dive down into human experience in the first place. That ought to tell you how special you are to the God who created you. When we recite the creed, we're saying he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And what is he doing there? Well, the Bible says he's bringing our needs to the Father's attention. I want you to notice two passages from the Bible that I've included in your outline. The first one is Hebrews 7, 25. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And then there's Romans 8, 34, which says, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, I love to meditate on that thought. You know, I've prayed for people in my office or in the hospital or on the phone, and afterwards they say, thank you, Pastor, I feel a bit better, I feel stronger already. If we draw comfort from the prayer of a common pastor, imagine the Lord Jesus himself praying for you. He's praying for your marriage right now. He's praying for your success in school right now. He sees your discouragement, and he prays for fresh hope. He sees your fear, and he prays for courage. He sees you weakening to a temptation, and he prays for strength. And when we fail, Jesus says, Father, remember my death for him. Remember my death for her, and forgive. You are his treasure. Jesus dove down from the heights of heaven, descending even into the deepest, darkest experiences of human life, and rising back up to heaven with our lives in his hands. In Matthew 16, verse 15, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He asked his disciples that question because the answer to that question makes all the difference in the world. Now, it was Simon Peter who spoke up for the group and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now it's your turn. What's your answer? <laughs> 